afternoon. My name is uh, Santi Furnari and I'm based at the uh, Base Business School in London, where I'm connecting from. And indeed, thanks to the organization Theory Journal and the OMT Division of the Academy of Management, Organization Management Theory Division, for supporting this event. And thank you, Ibrat, in particular, to, uh, for the great initiative, the New Scholars Network, that uh, I follow with interest on, on YouTube. So as uh, you know, the session of today is about theory and theorizing. We call it from theory to theorizing, practice, practicing multiple styles of theorizing. Um, the way you and I thought to structure the session is to start very briefly about uh, definitions, what is theory, what is theorizing, and why should we care about it? And also introduce three theorizing styles, propositional, process, and configurational theorizing, different ways of doing theory. Uh, the core of the session will be about unpacking two out of three theorizing styles, particularly the propositional and configurational styles of theorizing. As part of the New Scholars Network initiative, uh, you will also have a session with Han Langley, which will also talk more in detail about processes. So you and I thought to focus more on proposition configuration for today. And what we want to keep it very practical, hopefully, and also illustrate uh, the, the style of the, each style of theorizing with a published example. We will also maybe conclude with some general suggestions for theorizing and have Q&A. Uh, at different moments, I will pose and you will pose to invite questions um, before we get to the core of the presentation, which will be about the sides of theorizing. So um, to start with, what is theory? This is a question that can be uh, answered in many ways. And we thought to keep it simple for today um, and really start with this definition. A theory is a statement that explains why and or how a phenomenon occurs. This uh, very simple definition uh, from uh, Swedberg book, The Art of Social Theory, is a definition that of course implies a given perspective of what theory is, a perspective that can be called explanatory. There are different perspectives on what a theory is. And indeed, you uh, um, uh, piece together with Marcus Soler and David Seidel that you had as a pre-reading for today, explain uh, and illustrates those multiple traditions very effectively. You could think of theory as critique rather than theory as an as explanation. For, the, for today's session, we'll focus on theory as an explanation. And I would like to emphasize that a theory is a statement. And so by statement here, uh, we mean indeed a, a, a verbal statement. So a theory is a linguistic device to start with that has, uh, has to do with language. And we'll go back to the importance of language for theory before. Now, what is theorizing? It's actually the process you go about uh, to develop a theory. And so theorizing is very practical and includes activities that all of you have practiced in many ways, I'm sure, when you write a paper, a paper that can be conceptual or also empirical, but with theory building, as we will see. Uh, so theorizing includes, for example, mental simulation, thought experiments that you may think, or imagination, think about ideas, or verbal articulation of arguments, writing down arguments, and visualization, models, figures, and sketches. Uh, these are all very practical activities that we do once we theorize. So by theorizing, we need a very practical process by which we develop a theory. It's also important to remind ourselves that actually it's not just academic who theorize. It's like theory has been often conceived as the domain of academics, but in many ways, every human being theorizes when tries to make sense of the world. So there are uh, everyday thinking skills that we all use in making sense of the world, in coming up with explanations, right, of why things happen in the world. Um, so we do, all of us actually have inside of us uh, a theorist in many ways, if you want. 
Uh, and this also explains why I think, and, uh, and we've been thinking uh, through this with, with you, why should we care about theory and theorizing? Yes, of course, it is important to uh, get published. And we all know that uh, our journals, especially in management, require a theoretical contribution, whether the paper is empirical or, or conceptual. But it is also important, going back to what uh, Ibrat was saying about the relevance of research, to remind ourselves of, of the broader purpose of theory and theorizing. And the broader purpose is actually to get to better explanations, better explain and understand phenomena we are interested in. And so we as social scientists are inherently curious about complex phenomena that we want to understand and explain. Theory and theorizing help us to get to better explanations and better understanding of those phenomena. And there is also an important civic and social dimension, if you want, of theory and theorizing. I have here as a provocation, a picture of Quanon and uh, Quanon protest uh, where conspiracy theorists, and I think it is interesting, the word that conspiracy theory has theory in, uh, in, in the label, uh, uh, actually uh, come up with what often are logically um, erroneously uh, theories, right? That are not based in facts. And so good theorizing and good theory, hopefully as a social scientist that will allow us also to debunk some of the bad theorizing and bad theories that unfortunately in our times uh, see, we see um, spreading over. And so it is an important activity beyond publishing uh, because it allows us to get to better explanations of important phenomena. It's also important to remind ourselves that theory is not just about writing conceptual papers, but empirical papers are also uh, inherently theoretical. Indeed, reviewers and editors rightly ask for a theoretical contribution. And so strong theory is required. And so in many ways, uh, the distinction between empirical and theoretical papers is artificial. It's a conventional distinction of our field. But in many ways, uh, uh, it is impossible to separate the two because even when we write a conceptual paper, we are immersed and embedded in the empirical world. And we often start our theoretical intuition from empirical observation, from anecdotes. Uh, and so in, in many ways, theorizing in an empirical vacuum is more fiction than fact. And empirical and theoretical domains are connected. What changes is that in a conceptual paper, as it is defined in our field, uh, we have more space as authors to flesh out our theory uh, than in an empirical paper where we actually have to go through the methods, data collection, data analysis. That is an opportunity for us as authors to really make our theory a strong theory. And that perhaps explains why conceptual papers remain to be highly cited in our field and highly respected. Um, with that, uh, let me move to the, the last slides of this segment that, that speaks about different styles of theorizing, as I mentioned. And this um, table has been inspired by um, editorial in AMR that Yup uh, Cornelison, who is gonna uh, talk in a second, also has, uh, has written uh, in 2017. It's an adapted version where we are actually uh, thinking about multiple uh, styles of theorizing. And what is a style of theorizing? It goes back to what I mentioned initially. A theory fun is fundamentally a verbal statement. It's not the only definition of a theory, but in our field is often a verbal statement. So it has to do with language. Then if that is the case, the kind of writing and the way in which we craft our arguments on paper while writing, it is very important. And often there are different idioms, if you want, if you want different genres of grammars that are available out there. They are broadly understood by communities of scholar and they allow us to cast theoretical arguments in different language. And so a propositional style of theorizing, to give an example of the first style, is one way in which in writing, we can cast our theoretical argu arguments through the language of theoretical propositions. This is a style of writing, a, st a style of argumentation. 
that is broadly understood as a genre, as a genre in our field. This is mostly well suited to capture cause and effect relations that are mostly linear between explanatory attributes and an outcome of interest, something you want to explain, the phenomenon you want to explain. Process theorizing instead as a style cast arguments in the language of a narrative, in the language of a process model. They is very well suited to capture how complex sequence of events actually unfold and lead to an outcome under different contingencies. A third style of theorizing actually casts arguments in the language of configurations of explanatory attributes. And it's very good to uh, explain how these multiple attributes combine to produce an outcome. So capture what I will define as a causal complexity. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, we will focus and zoom in on propositional theorizing and configurational theorizing today. But before doing that, let me pause here and invite maybe two or three questions maximum so we can get to the core of our presentation. We will then have more time for more questions and a good, uh, a good chunk of time will be, will be devoted to Q&A at the end of the session too. So if you could please raise your hand and I can see that I already have first question. If you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. Um, Fritjof, and I hope I'm not misspelling your name, please. No worries, uh, it's Fritjof. Um, I was engaging once with a philosopher of science and uh, she said that uh, the cat on the doormat is red, already is a kind of theory. And so what I'm asking is more so to say, how practical then theory become? Uh, so instead of splitting it up, uh, how, how can we see the theorizing in practice? For example, how, how practitioners theorize? So is your question how our practitioners theorize or how can we as academics bring theory to practice and have theory? How, how can we study their theorizing, so to say? Oh, well, in, in, in many ways, it's a very interesting question. And I think uh, if you think I think we, we could use, and I think this has not been done as much as pos as it could be done. Uh, we could use some of our same tools to understand theorizing and theory development processes in academia to better understand actually the way they go about their own theories. And some literatures, I'm thinking about the literature on performativity or the literature on sense-making, Carl Weick work and, and a lot of work that follow his pioneering statements, in many ways do that. So these are good pointers. So I think if you would be interested in, in expanding that line of work, I can certainly can see many avenues where you can bring some of the conversation, for example, we are gonna have today about styles of theorizing and think about how a given community of practitioners theorize with different styles of thinking. Do they theorize more propositional and in a linear way, or do they theorize more in terms of process or configurations to use the example? There are good pointers there. It's a very good question. Thank you. Anyone Hello, else? Yes, hi. Hello, it's Samar from uh, Huddersfield, working with Manchester Metropolitan. Uh, how do you differentiate between theory and philosophy and how much impact does that have with the uh, ontological or epistemological positions a researcher takes on? Thank you, Samar. So, um, well, philosophy, I would say, first of all, is more of a discipline, but of course, as you say, it is connected with uh, uh, theorizing and the development of theory. Uh, one distinction, certainly, for the kind of definition that we're using today of theory is that we are using, uh, we are, um, we are uh, talking about a theory, a theory of something, a theory of a phenomenon, and how you develop a, a theory of something, of a phenomenon that you want to explain. So we're not talking necessarily about theory with a big T, with a, um, you know, a capital letter theory, in terms of a more of a meta theory on perspectives, often institutional theory, for example, in management is labeled as a theory, but you can think of that theory as a more of a grand theory or meta theory, a set of family of different theories 
they're trying to explain different phenomena. So this is, a, I think, an important distinction between uh, 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 sometimes what the domain of philosophy is and what the domain of theorizing here is in management, in particular, the kind of definition we're going to use today uh, of a theory, a theory of a phenomenon. That's what we are after. I hope that addresses your, your question. So, yes, thank you very much. It is quite complicated and for an ECR, uh, it will take some time to understand. But if if I see this question now in connection with if we are doing theoretical study, a, research, a literature review paper, so that's more theoretical, but how do we place that on the on, on this line of where we see you know, that's theoretical and that's empirical. So what is the theoretical contribution out of that? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Sorry, complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. I, I, I will keep the answer brief in the interest of time, but we can get back to that. I think it's an important question about theoretical contribution. Generally, especially in empirical papers uh, where reviewers and editors look for, is a more general statement that go beyond the setting and the data you observed. And so a more transferable, they, we often use the word general, but something more transferable, an explanation that can be transferred to different settings and can explain also uh, related phenomena that happen in different settings. So this is a very simple way of thinking about theoretical contribution in empirical papers, again, to keep things simple. I also see there are more hands raised. And so um, I invite all of you, and it's great that, that you ask questions. I'm, I'm enjoying this a lot to write your questions in the chat uh, because we will get back to the questions in the chat in the Q&A session at the end of the session today. Uh, in the interest of time, as I mentioned, uh, we were planning to take uh, uh, two, or three, um, two or three questions for this segment. And then, uh, because we want to get also back to the uh, core of the presentation, which is about the two styles of theorizing. So please put your questions in the chat and I'll pass it on now to uh, uh, Yub Cornelison. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Santi. So, um, so it's great to already have so many questions. And um, I also didn't introduce myself yet. Uh, so my name is Yub Cornelis. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of uh, Organization of Theory and actually very happy with Santi to be here uh, doing this together and also to be, um, to be with you, such an international crowd and, and uh, also all this enthusiasm about theory and, and, and writing papers is, uh, is something that is clearly coming through. So hopefully at the end um, We'll do our segment on the uh, the two styles as uh, Santi explained, and we'll try and make it as practical as possible. But uh, at the end, we'll, we should have, if we if we do it well, if we keep momentum and keep to our time slots, then we should have a bit of time to uh, to answer all of these types of questions, these broader questions that you're already asking. Um, so for my bit, I'm going to talk about one style, and um, Santi made the point that sometimes it's a bit artificial to make a clear cut distinction between theoretical and empirical papers. Uh, I'm still gonna make the artificial distinction here in the sense that I want to talk about a particular type of uh, approach that you see in many theoretical papers. And this is the, uh, the propositional style. Um, and I talk about it in, in terms of, you know, the key elements of that type of paper. Uh, and then we could perhaps talk afterwards about um, you know, any, any similarities that you might see with empirical papers or any other things that, that, that my discussion triggers for you. Uh, but let me, let me do my bit first. And, and what I propose is that I'll talk a little bit about the style itself, how we see it in, in theoretical papers uh, being reflected. Then I'll give you one example and then we'll break again for, for some questions. Um, and I think, I think the best way to, uh, so on this slide, I've try to capture some of the key elements, at least in my mind, of the propositional style, which is firmly in this explanatory tradition that, um, that Santi mentioned. So obviously we're using natural language, a form of reasoning, in this case, reasoning through propositions, propositional statements that we make. Uh, so think also of, of theory papers that you might have read 
whereas a line of argumentation being laid out and then at the end of different segments of that paper you have proposition one proposition two proposition three being stated that's the type of paper that i'm talking about and we're using if we use this style we're using um, verbal reasoning and thinking in terms of propositions to better explain a topic so we're trying to get at the fundamental structures and forces that determine a particular topic. So linked to that definition from Svetberg, why or how something occurs, that's what we want to explain. What, what drives the key operations of that phenomenon, what drives and determines why it operates in a particular way, why it occurs in a particular way, or leads in a very, um, in a very general sense to particular outcomes that we, uh, that we observe. Um, I think this type of reasoning, at least in my mind, is quite an established, formalized type of reasoning, uh, meaning that it's been used over and over again. And I, I saw in the chat that someone asked um, something around um, so reasoning from formal axioms. So in philosophy, when people talk about propositional reasoning, a lot of philosophers talk about that type of reasoning as deducing conclusions from formally stated actions, so very stylized, high-level sets of assumptions. In the field of business and management, when we talk about propositional reasoning, it's more a case that I work off a particular theoretical lens or perspective on a topic, so I frame the topic theoretically in a particular way, and I then use that framing, so let's say it's agency theory, resource dependence theory, practice-based perspective, whatever theory I'm working off, I'm extending that into a set of propositions, propositional arguments that I'm making first verbally uh, in the text itself, and then culminating at the end, as I said, in P1, P2, P3. And the proposition, as uh, Santi showed in the table itself, is typically of a very simple, elegant format. So it's these if-then statements. So there's, there's an assumption underlying it that if once you've spelled out the proposition, it really captures uh, the key causal dynamics of A, in a way you could say A, uh, affecting or determining or triggering uh, B. The stance that you take with this type of reasoning is, I would say, the, um, I suppose the classic social science stance where you're writing your piece as if you're looking into a topic, but you're also removed from it. So you're not writing your own person into the, um, into the paper as you would do, for instance, with a critical essay. So you still keep that social science distanced objective view, because again, our, our aim is to get at these fundamental uh, structures and forces that determine a particular phenomenon and, and that we want to explain. And typically with this, this, um, this type of reasoning, you also assume, I would say, a, a certain vantage point. So, so a lot of management work typically assumes for, for this type of reasoning that the propositions that you spell out help managers, for instance, as Santi said, in terms of the link to practice, help managers better, uh, you help you explain uh, a phenomenon better, but with that, you also help managers uh, from their vantage point, be able to, to do a better job uh, managing their organizations. Uh, and the structure of this paper is, is, as I said, it's very formalized, established style of, uh, of putting a theory paper together typically consists of a scientific article format. So you introduce the topic, then you review and synthesize uh, at, at the level of theory past work around that topic. You problematize it to create an opening. Uh, then you propose your own reasoning, your own theory development, typically culminating in a model and a, and a set of propositions. And then you end with uh, discussion and implications. Um, I think for yourself, if you want to do this, style of theorizing, um, um, and I suppose this is not unique to this particular style, is that you would first of all think obviously about you know, the topic that you're working on. And I know that if you're working, um, you know, if you're doing a PhD or if you're working on a new topic or a new project, you know, the topic for your research can obviously shift and it can change and the question can still change over time. Uh, but obviously you need to start with a topic so that you can know as a sort of anchor what you're theorizing about. And, and a topic can be a phenomenon uh, that is out there, so to speak, independent of how we conceptualize it, that we want to explain. Uh, so in this case, 
the question of how do people interpret the changing work environment. But in some cases, a topic can also be, um, also in the context of theory papers, a previously already theorized subject. And so like that question that I've got on the slide here, uh, and where we've seen lots of uh, recent contributions theorizing uh, the, the theoretical subject of sense making in, in different ways. Um, but practically for yourself, think about your topic and a rudimentary question that you're for now focusing on. And then the key step, if you're doing this propositional style, is to first look at how have previously people been theoretically conceptualizing this particular topic. Uh, so we're looking, you're looking at the conceptual resources, the concepts, but also the broader theoretical discourses that have been brought to bear on that, that particular topic. And a key step then would be to really map out, uh, not just summarize the broad strokes of a literature, not just summarize findings, broad sets of findings, but really dig into the, at the theory level, the different theoretical perspectives, the different concepts that have been used, the different levels of analysis, uh, the sets of assumptions that, that uh, the literature have been, has been operating from. And that's important because we're writing a theory paper here. So you need to move from a summative review to really a theoretical synthesis. And sometimes that type of synthesis of different perspectives, different vantage points, different theories on the subject, sometimes you find that easily when you pick up a review paper in IJMR or the Academy of Management Annals or, you know, there, there's journals that publish these, uh, if, the, if the body, if there is a su substantial body of work and the topic is a bit more developed, there could be a review that you could draw on to help you figure this out. So what are these different theoretical resources that people have been working from? If that isn't the case yet, um, then you have to do some of that yourself. You have to do the synthesizing, you have to think about different sets of assumptions that, um, that different scholars have, have been operating from, different perspectives, um, and you would have to start typecasting a little bit what, uh, what the, the, the level playing field is, so what the, the, at the theory level, the common ground around a particular topic is. That's important because then the third step is to figure out, am I going to build on uh, a resource, a perspective, and with that, a set of concepts that already exist to answer my question. So let's say the question, how do people interpret the changing work environment? I'm sure there's social tech, I'm not an expert on this, by the way, there's social technical perspectives, practice perspectives, there's resource, routine perspectives, there's all sorts of perspectives that, that, that you could take, but probably, you know, we're looking first at the ones that have been taking, have been taken already, because then I know, am I going to draw uh, on an existing resource or perspective, or am I going to put, uh, put a, a different perspective into the mix and, and offer an alternative? Um, so we're talking about conceptualization, and that's really an important first step uh, for any form of theorizing, but particularly also for the propositional style. It's, it's, it's maybe, so the, you know, we think of the propositional style as you know, your reasoning and, and then you know, stating these propositions at the end, but you know, the, um, the core of it is figuring out how we, how we conceptualize a particular topic and whether we work off a resource that already exists. So I mentioned also some here on this slide. Um, or do I offer an alternative uh, as, as a starting point, as a way into this topic with potential for it to be theorized differently and for a set of propositional arguments to, uh, to be made? Um, so think about again, at the level of theory, the resources, the perspectives that have already been brought to bear on a topic. Think about what you pack yourself on. Uh, so if I use, let's say, paradox theory or identity work, if I use it, do I use it coherently? Do I use it consistently all the way through my manuscript? Um, have I clearly signaled that this is the overarching perspective or resource that I'm reasoning from? Um, and have I, have I also clearly positioned it vis-a-vis uh, -vis existing topics, vis-a-vis uh, -vis existing resources and perspectives that already exist on the topic. So that's, let's say that if paradox theory is something new uh, in relation to, uh, to a particular topic, uh, based on what is already out there, that I really clearly articulate why it's different, 
why it's important, why it's maybe more adequate or more comprehensive, state my reasons for why this new resource needs to be brought into the, uh, into the conversation. Uh, so a resource gives you a perspective. It gives you uh, a coherent vantage point from which to reason about a, a particular topic. And then it helps if you know, there's a, a literature there that you can draw on because that gives you already uh, concepts to work with. It gives you a, a broader perspective. Um, but with that, and that's easy to sort of piggyback on. Uh, so that's good to, to have in place. Uh, and I would also say use that to your advantage. But then at the same time, check for yourself, is my argumentation all the way through still consistent with that resource? Have I defined my concepts or the concepts that, I, that I'm bringing forward here, that I'm foregrounding in my manuscript in line with that broader resource? So again, if it's paradox theory, be very clear about what type of paradox theory you work from, the concepts that you then work on, whether it's something around experimentation or, you know, iterating between two poles. Or, again, I'm not a, a paradox theorist myself, but whatever concepts you come up with, make sure that they're coherent with that overarching resource or, or perspective. And then finally, also think about the, um, the what I call is the, the animating logic, the, uh, the core logic that, that you often find in something like paradox theory or identity work. You know, is my reasoning all the way through consistent with that, again, with that resource and the, or the overall perspective that I'm drawing on? So if you take an example like identity work, which is one particular perspective uh, on the topic of identity, that assumes that, uh, you know, identity of an individual is a constant act of, is, is, is constantly being produced and reproduced. So I, as an individual, uh, I, I'm constantly engaged and I have agency as well, but I'm constantly engaged in this, this process of, of recalibrating and reconstructing who I am in, in particular sets of circumstances or over time. Um, so if I then develop arguments and a set of propositions uh, on identity, those and, and if this is my hook, my resource that I draw from, that my line of reasoning needs to be consistent with those base assumptions. If I then shift ground to, let's say, social identity or more cognitive other perspectives on identity, you can see there would be a, a potential of a disconnect there. Uh, let me speed up a bit because I, I realize that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm taking more time than I, I should. Sorry about that, Santi. I hope that's okay. Um, I've got one example just to, uh, to put this uh, in perspective for you. So this is a paper from uh, organization theory. So I'm obviously a little bit biased, but I, I want to also share this, this paper with you. But uh, it's also a, a really good example of this, uh, of this style. Uh, and here you have two authors who uh, are asking a very interesting question. So their topic is basically, um, you know, what happens if an organization is accused of misconduct? Um, and previously, we had crisis communication literature. We had media framing literature showing that, obviously, um, you know, when, when, when uh, an organization is cast in a negative light, there may be reputational panel penalties. And it's important that, and that's the suggestion then in that literature, that an organization responds to, an, to such an accusation. But the actual detail of how they do so and the discourse that they may use to... Um, to defend themselves, as well as maybe shift the blame to other parties had not been, been theorized. So they start with a very clear topic. Um, they then say, let's mobilize as a resource discourse theory to think about this question, this topic in a bit more detail and to start to elaborate a set of theoretical arguments of what organizations, as well as the people working for them, could do potentially to shift the blame or to deny that any act of wrongdoing has, has taken place. And, and as you were, uh, I'm just thinking of uh, the recent case of, of Facebook playing out this week, where Facebook is being obviously by a whistleblower being accused of uh, many acts of wrongdoing, including through Instagram, putting uh, young teenage girls at risk and, and knowingly doing that because they've done the research apparently according to her on that. You can see coming back to Santi's point that this is theorizing, but it directly has as a, a practical uh, link as well. 
What is interesting in this paper is, and you, you often see that as well with propositional papers, is that um, here they're blending uh, uh, existing work on crisis communication and misconduct. And, and that has been mostly, as I said, about these, uh, uh, the role of the media and, and the framing on the part of the media. There's a little bit of work on, um, on crisis communication response strategies, but they're saying that's not enough. We need to really mobilize discourse theory as an alternative resource. And they don't pit it against it, but they merge the two together on the assumption that um, you know, both literatures talk about how accusations of misconduct are socially constructed and within them have charges of who's to blame. Uh, within them have, have a, an accusation of an, a real act of wrongdoing that is morally wrong. Um, so discourse plays out in both. So there's enough uh, compatibility or correspondence between, between the two. Uh, and I'm mentioning that because also in your case, if you're blending or combining theoretical resources together, uh, this question of, of making resources, uh, you know, sometimes they are compatible at the outset. You could say in this case, that's pretty much the case. So you can shove them into one another. In other cases, that may not be the case. So then, uh, and there's some very small font references to, uh, to uh, particularly the paper by Ocus and then Bonardi in AMR, where they talk about what, could you, what can you do, thinking about these steps, uh, if, you have, have, if you're blending resources where there's at least at the outset incompatible assumptions, then you have to do a little bit of work and you have to write that work that you do to bring the two resources together into your, into your manuscript. But coming back to the, uh, the OT paper, the two are connected uh, and they give us a way, if we elaborate that combination, they give us a way to think about the discursive games that play out uh, after a, 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 an accusation of misconduct. And they talk about that in terms of theory of, uh, uh, a theory of blame games, where the accused organization, as well as then maybe individuals in that organization, can try strategically through discourse. So discourse is seen here as something that you use strategically to further your own ends, uh, to, to displace that blame and to, to shift it hopefully onto someone else. Uh, at, as part of their theorizing, they say, this is also typical of uh, many propositional papers. So again, you know, it's a linear proposition, if then, that we're looking for, uh, that we're looking to make. Um, so the if in this case is different for different scenarios that they say play out. So there could be a case where there's ambiguity about, is it really an act of moral wrongdoing? Yes, no, maybe. Or if it's clearly settled in the court of public opinion, so according to the media, but also according to other stakeholders that you know Volkswagen was really to blame when they were, um, you know, when they were uh, accused of that software that they had in, uh, in, uh, installed in their cars. Um, and the second dimension is not just whether it's more wrongdoing uh, and whether that's settled, uh, but also whether uh, you're to blame for it or whether it's still a bit out in the open, a bit more ambiguous as to whether uh, you as, a, as an in individual organization are really culpable for this. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of this in detail, but uh, they use those, the characterization of those types of conditions to basically say, if that's the situation that an accused organization is confronted with, then it's more likely that they take a, a, a subsequent step as a response. So take, uh, maybe it's because it's in my mind now, the, uh, the Facebook case this, this week. So the whistleblower, through the whistleblower, the media is laying the act accusation at the feet of Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook that, um, among other things, they're putting uh, through Instagram the, um, the sanity and I suppose the health of, of young women at risk. Um, Mark Zuckerberg responded yesterday or uh, the day before where he said, yes, okay, you know, uh, so he can't deny the attribution that this is about them as a company and their responsibility. But he can try and make it more ambiguous as to whether it's really an act of, uh, of wrongdoing. So he said, yes, we knew about some of that research. Actually, we commissioned it ourselves. And we are using some of that information in a very um, considerate manner. And there's no way 
he, he so he he, he uh, went against that accusation that brought charge that uh, they were putting profits uh, before responsibility. Uh, so that would be a deny wrongfulness uh, sort of uh, response or proposition too. I, I don't have time to go through all of these, but some of the things that, uh, and we can connect this to this paper, that you need to ask yourself when you're writing a propositional uh, theory building paper is, you know, is, my, is, is the core logic of my reasoning there all the way through? Um, so in this case, we're working with discourse as a, as, a, as a strategic use of language to shift the blame onto someone else. Is that consistently the logic that drives the set of arguments that I'm developing and the propositions that I've, that I've, that I've stipulated? Uh, and I would say in this case, the answer is yes, uh, but that's something you need to really ask yourself when you're, when you're developing uh, a propositional paper, lay out your model, and, and then also at the level of each of the propositions that you've stated. Um, is the line of reasoning elegant, parsimonious, simple? Um, so we might come back to this when we also hear from Santi in a minute, but one strength of the, uh, or one, I, I should boast, one characteristic of the propositional style is that it really focuses on these if-then statements. So it has a very simple, notion of causality as its root. So like what we've seen, there's a certain set of circumstances that you're confronted with uh, by as an accused organization, then it's more likely that you take a, a certain response in, in, in a, a certain response in return. Um, so it's a very simple, generalized uh, uh, argument that you make. And, and if you make it too complex, then uh, this, this parsimonious element, this elegance will also suffer uh, on the part of the, the propositions that you've developed. Uh, does the model and the propositions that, that it involves, do they really add value over and beyond prior work? Do, so in this case, going back to the paper, do they really help us deepen and extend our thinking of what happens following an accusation of misconduct? I would say yes, it really pushes us to think about uh, this in novel ways, very focused, you might say simple ways, but very novel ways that help, help us push our thinking forward. And they also accommodate concepts from prior work. So they offer a slightly roomier perspective in which they can accommodate concepts like uh, scapegoating and risk, uh, uh, yeah, scape, uh, scapegoating and whistleblowing. Um, uh, those two concepts are, are also uh, included. Um, and then the final thing to ask with the model and propositions is really this comprehensiveness. Have you written out your arguments in full and done that really, have you really developed them substantively before you state your propositions? And, and that's really, really important so that the argument isn't carried by the formally stated proposition, but the argument is really carried, the weight of it is really carried by the text itself. Um, then the propositions, when you state them, make sure that they're high level enough so that they're really at the level of theorized processes or relationships between concepts or constructs. And we saw that also in the, uh, in the OT paper, as opposed to stating uh, possible relationships or correlations between measurement terms or variables, that's too specific. And that's more akin to a hypothesis testing piece, an empirical piece, as opposed to what we're doing here, which is to operate at the level of theory, so slightly higher level of abstraction. Um, that's also important because when you stated these propositions at that higher level of abstraction, they, they, they add value, but they also, and they should appeal to authors, but they should also signal or reference directions for research. They like broad, um, um, you know, broad contingencies that further work could examine in a bit more empirical uh, detail. So going back to the, uh, the paper that I mentioned, each of the propositions can still be oper operationalized in different ways, but they give us a, di a direction of travel, a direction to go for a line of thinking in a particular way. Uh, and then the statement of the proposition should really highlight a clear operational process or mechanism. And, and the criticism sometimes is that uh, that's absent or uh, and the criticism also sometimes is that it's not really, the proposition is not really 
uh, um, sort of focused around one operational process, but it has too many moving parts, too many clauses, too many interactions. Uh, and that, again, uh, sort of sacrifices that parsimonious, elegant uh, notion of the propositional style. Uh, and then there are some other points there that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll that you see on the slide that are also important to uh, to avoid. So circularity, where the outcome is already implied by the uh, by the antecedent condition uh, or by the core concept itself that that you're focusing on, or the proposition being just a broad summary statement, but not a description of a contingent if then relationship as such. Um, so just to summarize, these are some of the things that are important to think about uh, when, you, uh, when you write a propositional piece. So we said, think about your resource that you're working from, work from that resource in a consistent and, and, um, and, and uh, logical manner, extend that into a set of propositions, lay out your argumentation first before you state P1, P2, P3. Um, and then check for yourself some of these challenges that, that we've got on the slide here. So do they really move beyond the existing literature? Um, do, they, are they see, or do they appeal? Are they seen as generative, really highlighting these broader research directions that uh, colleagues can move into? Uh, and are they more than just uh, a set of correlational hypotheses? Um, and one, and we've already mentioned some, or I've already mentioned some things that you could do, but um, I think the best advice is to really write your argumentation first before you uh, state the proposition. The proposition is just the culmination of the argument. It, it's, it's, um, it's maybe a bit like a figure. It adds, but it's not the core argumentation as such. It distills the core argumentation, but the core argumentation should be laid out in the text first. Um, and then also for yourself, so like maybe the OT example that we just discussed, uh, it's good to, um, if you really want to have this more generative, broader appeal to your arguments, to see are there many examples, cases that I could potentially explain with this line of reasoning and with the propositions that I've developed. So a case like the Facebook example that I just gave you. Um, it's not that you're going to write all of these examples in, but it just gives you a way of, of figuring out, is my theorizing broad and generative enough to, uh, to, to work and to appeal to a community. And as always, ask your colleagues around you to, uh, to help you with this and to test your reasoning uh, and then maybe guess the proposition uh, based on the text that you, uh, that you supply them with. Uh, I'm sorry I took a little bit longer. I'm, I'm uh, also towards Santi, I'm, my apologies, but uh, this is the point where we'll break this, this section. And, uh, and I haven't been able to see the chat, but there may be one or two questions that you would like to ask at this point. Yeah, Ibad, please. You, um, as you know, we're also streaming this on YouTube. So there's a um, couple of questions in the YouTube that I'd like to read out. Um, one question is by Doug, uh, who happens to be joining from Sydney. So it's quite late there. Wow. Yeah. Um, one o'clock, I think he said. His question is, um, in regard to what you just said, you know, does your alternative explanation leave the core postulates intact in regards to the theory applied or does it alter the underlying truth claims? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, cool. Um, so this may be back to the, um, to an understanding of what, what we mean with propositional reasoning. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be defensive, but I'm, I'm just trying to, to, uh, so uh, speaking to Doc, um, trying to convey that the generalized understanding of propositional reasoning in business and management research is a bit different from philosophy and is yet again a bit different from what you find in other parts of the social sciences. Um, so in our case, it means that you, uh, I say in our case, but in, in the case of business and management research, it's typically working off a particular resource or lens, and that includes a set of assumptions. I don't know if that's the same as a, as a postulate, but it assumes a set of uh, generic assumptions that you're working from and that you, uh, that you keep, I would say, consistent. So if we go back to that OT example, I'm working off a set of assumptions. Uh, there's different traditions of discourse and discourse analysis, but we're working off a set of functional strategic assumptions around the use of discourse. 
Um, and then I'm extending that into a set of um, logically connected uh, claims, propositional claims of what I expect to happen in this set of circumstances. I don't think you refute or alter in this case, the underlying assumptions fundamentally. It's, it's typically that, um, and maybe that's also why a lot of editors and reviewers with theory papers always focus so much on the assumptions that you know they want them to be to be clear and that you have you reason from it in a in a consistent manner. Um, so I, I don't think you change them. Uh, maybe, maybe you revise them or adjust them a little bit as part of the reasoning, but I don't think you fundamentally change them. And if I may, one more question also from from YouTube. Um, Irene is asking. What is meant by conceptualization? Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. So conceptualization is 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 is, is actually when uh, and we talk about this in the editorial that uh, that was mentioned. It's 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 a key part of any form of theorizing, including actually the the theorizing that happens uh, outside of academia. So we look at instances. So we look at certain phenomena. Uh, in 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 light of a, a broader abstract conceptual uh, concept, um, so I see uh, my uh, need to think about my identity as identity work. So I abstract from the phenomenon, from the topic, to a lens, a resource through which I make make sense of that particular topic, and and that's something that we do all the time. And and coming back to Santi's provocation. Um, if I think about QAnon um, um, followers, uh, they also reason, they also theorize, and probably a lot of their conceptualizations, how they think about certain uh, bits of news that they read or how they think about actions that they take will be conceptualized from the perspective of their own identity, their own uh, motivated reasoning uh, about how the world is as it is, and that may be part of, you know, sort of more conspiracy, uh, maybe more of a conspiracy element uh, to that. But that type of conceptualization is, is core to any form of theorizing. And we, we often tend to push it in the background, but it's, it's really core. And it's core to a propositional style of reasoning as it is to, to many other forms of theorizing where we make that choice. So we decide what is this phenomenon in case of conceptually speaking. So I make a choice as to what resource or lens I mobilize to look at this particular phenomenon in a particular way. Thank you, you. There are a couple of more raised hands there, if you want to take them. Now, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask Joe a question. Um, you know, sometimes a theory, they have some propositions. I would like to, can I challenge or rem remedy this prop proposition in this way? Uh, this proposition tells that A influence B or A have some positive effects. Uh, I would like to remedy this proposition just like, uh, um, I think that this, uh, this point is uh, is correct, but there have some limitation. So just like uh, in a uh, dialectical thinking ways, first is 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 uh, correct, but uh, maybe as uh, sometimes it have some dark sides. So can I challenge this original proposition in this way, or do you have another suggestions? Yeah, I think I think you can, um, and I. I think it's often nice if the, uh, the the core proposition that you challenge is really uh, sort of an exemplar, you know, the prototype, if you like, of a, of a particular theoretical perspective. Um, so it could be identity work, paradox theory, agency theory. If, you know, some of the core propositions, if you challenge them, uh, and, and that could be in a constructive manner, then I want to further qualify them. There's maybe further contingencies that I see, or maybe... Yeah further paths that I see of why and how A may be connected to B, uh, following your example. I think that that in itself would be, uh, would be really helpful and would be really, I'm sure for yeah. a particular captive audience, for a community, very valuable theoret theoretical work to be doing. Because you're speaking yes. to that community, you're speaking to 
some of their core assumptions and the default logic and, and the default proposition that they've been operating from. And you can challenge and complement that in, in good ways. Yes, you know, sometimes some in some journal don't like this, 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 this way. Just like, uh, just like uh, I remember I attended a seminar that the uh, uh, author usually published top, top journals in SMD. So I asked a similar question that they ch he challenged me. And uh, <laughs> they think, you know, that is not correct. Uh, sometimes uh, they think that, uh, uh, he, he think that uh, uh, just uh, uh, this proposition, you should give a, a specific uh, points, your specific arguments. One is correct or one is, uh, uh, it is correct or it is uh, incorrect. So you, you should give a, a specific manner, not theoretical. So I feel confused. Just like you know that it just work uh, in some specific journal or it, or it's uh, worked this, this way, this thing here can be used in, can be used uh, uh, in man, in other journals, you know that's uh, yeah. That's I I feel just a little confused about these points. Could you share another knowledge or suggestions to um, focus some specific journal to uh, just like uh, uh, to just uh, to uh, to uh, you know that when I submit the paper. The, the reviews argues or challenge my proposition, my theoretical complication, uh, my theoretical implication. So, uh, how about um, to cope with this 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 issue? Could you please give more suggestion? Yeah. Cool. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you're asking very important uh, uh, questions. I. It, it's a bit hard to um, to judge. How to uh, how to uh, make your case to reviewers, you know, beyond a particular example. Um, so I think what you describe in general, I would think that there would be a lot of openness. I would hope also in in amongst mainstream journals, theory journals, towards the type of work that you're proposing, where you're in a very constructive way complicating the picture of why A may be connected, why and how A may be connected to B. So I can't see why that, why there shouldn't be room for that. Um, it may be as always that the, the, the devil is in the detail of how we reason, the points that we're making, um, the, uh, some of the things that I mentioned earlier, how we position the work that we have done vis-a-vis -vis, uh, existing work on the topic. Um, so it could be that some of these other points need to be in place as well uh, in the minds of reviewers before they get fully convinced of uh, you know, the very detailed set of arguments that you're making in between A and B. Um, I'm gonna, uh, uh, because I know Santi still has a, a wonderful bit to do. So I'm gonna uh, uh, refer to one thing because I, I noticed in the chat there was um, a question about the distinction between hypothesis and propositions. And um, it's not, uh, so it's maybe a bit like empirical and theoretical papers. Uh, you know, there's a lot of commonality between them. So there's a similar type of logic of reasoning that you see in both. Um, I think one, for me at least, one way to distinguish it is to really think at the level of measurement terms or variables that are being correlated. And typically with hypothesis, it's just the statement of an association that matters. It's not, you know, there's no explanation, there's no theorizing for why two variables are connected. Because the hypothesis is there to be verified on the back of the reasoning that I've done in the text prior to the hypothesis. With a propositional argument, it's not at the level of measurement terms or, or variables, but it's at the level of concepts, constructs, and broader theoretical perspectives that I'm operating. Um, and it's it's and, and typically there at the level of the stating of the proposition, there is an account of an underlying process or mechanism uh, going on. So going back to the OT paper, it specifies this this it assumes this strategic in inclination on the part of actors to 
respond to an accusation of misconduct and it assumes that there's then a, a mechanism or process uh, leading to a particular type of response. Um, and that, that type of operational process is, as far as I know, typically not, not featured in a hypothesis as such, but, um, but think about the theory versus measurement level. That's, that's really also a key, key difference. So, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, I think I, I learned a lot from you. Uh, two points, two important points. First is that uh, you know, construct manner, not uh, yeah, construct manner. And then if we if some uh, proposition we would like to challenge the proposition, maybe we can start from the the concept itself or focus the measurements. Maybe maybe the something. The measurement, the measurement or concept cannot explain the full phenomena. We can we can from start from this point and then change this this concept, or we can give the other remediations. We can write other theoretical implication. Thank you, thank you, John. Yeah, I'm gonna thank hand you. over to Santi so we can continue. Thank you, Yup, and thank you everyone for asking questions. Uh, and this is actually exactly what we had hoped for, to have a, a more of a conversation. Of course, in the limited time we have, it's difficult uh, to get every question since the number of people is pretty high. So I encourage everyone who had raised their hands, I think there were two more hands raised. If you can just put your question in the chat, uh, Tuta and Susanna, and then we'll have your questions towards the end. We're happy to stay a bit longer as we agreed with Ibrat. Um, so in the interest of also going through uh, the other bit of content and the, the other style of theorizing uh, uh, we mentioned initially, um, I'm going to talk about configuration of theorizing. The idea, going back to that table I discussed earlier, and this is a core message of the session of today, is that there is no one single best way of doing theory. There is a plurality of different styles. And that's also, I think, what Anna's questions were, were, was pointing to. If you feel your, your reasoning and your arguments are uh, complex uh, and you are not able to articulate them into a simple if-then proposition, then maybe it's a different kind of style of writing and reasoning that you could experiment with, play with. And this is a core message you and I have been uh, uh, also uh, trying to work in our, in our uh, respective research. And so what is configuration theorizing really speaks to what I just said, because it starts from the premise that most social phenomena, and so most phenomena of interest for management scholars like us, feature what has been called causal complexity. In, in short, a complex, a complex phenomenon is better explained by multiple uh, uh, explanatory factors that interact and combine in different ways. And the ways in which those factors may interact may be contradictory, asymmetric, and may be equifinal. And so if that is the case, there's way more complexity out there in the world we want to explain than a simple uh, propositional or correlational kind of uh, theorizing and mode of reasoning will allow us to um, to take in, and, and, and that is not to dismiss at all the propositional style of theorizing, which has produced great insights and has the benefit, as you were saying, of parsimony. And so many great theories, think of transaction cost economics or resource dependency, have propositional statements that had uh, lots of impact on our field. So not to dismiss that, but if you want to play with then uh, understand how and why multiple explanatory factors combine into different configurations to explain a phenomenon, then you may want to embrace also different style of reasoning and writing, uh, which has been defined as configuration theorizing. And I think you all received this recent piece that a number of colleagues and myself have written uh, uh, for coming in AMR about capturing causal complexity heuristics for uh, configuration theorizing. The idea there is that really configuration theorizing is a style of thinking and writing 
that tries to capture these configurations. And by configurations here, we mean constellations of explanatory attributes that are held together by some orchestrating teams, some integrative mechanisms. I'm gonna provide an example in a second. Uh, but in terms of a parallel with what you were saying, the proposition theorizing, uh, the idiom here in terms of language is both formal and narrative. The idea is to combine analyt an analytical way of thinking and a meaningful synthetical way. So it's both analysis and synthesis and uh, mix semantic and syntactic form of explanation. Let me now provide an example, which I hope will, will make the, this clear. So, but just to provide a bit more background about where these ideas come from, there's a long tradition in management going way before this recent piece that we put together. Uh, think about Henry Mintzberg approach to strategy in terms of structures in five, right? Or the very um, famous typology of Miles and Snow of types of organizational strategies, prospector, defender, analyzer, reactor, or Michael Porter famous theories of strategy as activity systems, or Danny Miller's again, a key uh, work on uh, the configurations, organizational configurations, or Burns and, St and Stalker, uh, uh, um, you know, theories of uh, organic versus me mechanicistic organizational structures. And so what you have in all those classic examples is configurations, descriptions of organizations, of strategies um, in configurational terms, where it's not just one explanatory attribute that matters, but it's the combination of those attributes that we need to take into account. Those um, studies that have been pioneering use mostly case-based methods and typological styles of reasoning, theoretically, and also cluster analysis empirically. Uh, a second wave, if you want, of configuration studies has embraced different methods like sectoretic methodology, like QCA, or, or again, different ways of thinking configurationally through case studies or cluster analysis of a different type. And, and has advanced and elaborated this kind of, of, of thinking. That's why the double harrow, these two sets of studies are talking with each other. And I think a very good uh, example here is the one that I'm gonna provide uh, in a second to illustrate this style of theorizing. So the first thing to do, if you would like to embrace a configurational uh, style of theorizing is really motivate the need for a configurational theory of a given phenomenon. Why do we need a configurational theory that is by itself more complex than a more parsimonious theory? And just skimming through the literature of some of these studies that have been using configurational thinking, uh, there are three, for example, possibilities out of many others that I came up with. One first motivation could be describe your phenomenon of in interest in configurational terms, which means write down a paragraph or two that describes what you're talking about, but really makes clear, emphasize how the phenomenon results from a combination of multiple factors that interact. And we'll see this example in, uh, in a second in this Campbell and Oli uh, uh, paper that I'm gonna illustrate as an example. Another way in which you can motivate the need for configuration theory is that I'll, you could argue that although uh, the phenomenon has been extensively studied from multiple theoretical perspectives, each of these theoretical perspectives in a way emphasize one or a few explanatory attributes, but we still have contradictory mixed findings, which need, we, we should take these different factors highlighted by different theories into account together and really theorize their joint effect, their combined or configurational effect. I've done some studies together with Anna Grandori. They use this rhetorical uh, uh, device in terms of motivation, what they call the unresolved theoretical puzzle that needs more configuration explanation. Or you can, for example, take an existing typology, for example, Miles is known, it's very established, but also argue that that typology in terms of types is very useful and has actually contributed a lot to our field, but that's not really can be unpacked further because it's that not really specified in a fine grain way how the various elements could interact, the various elements of the typology. 
And this is what, for example, Pierre Fis has done very effectively in, in his 2011 piece or in his 2007 AMR. So the first step is really uh, motivate why you need a configuration explanation or a configuration theory of the phenomenon of your interest, rather than a more simple theory, if you want the highlights, if then be varied, so to speak, relationship between two or, or, or a few factors. Uh, the second bit, uh, and I want to provide an example from this paper that I'm gonna use, um, is a really powerful paper for those of you who want to uh, embrace configuration thinking and theorizing or, or whether you're just curious about it, not necessarily if you want to embrace it. If you're curious to know more, I highly recommend the paper. This really gives a sense on how a phenomenon, uh, which is merger and acquisition, that has been studied extensively from um, many uh, quantitative studies, can be uh, rethought through a configuration lens. So what this paper is about, and uh, again is by Joanna Campbell and co-authors in 2016 in AMJ, and has a lot of theory building in it, uh, 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 despite of course being empirical, meaning it's both empirical and theory building, as is always the case in AMJ. What you see there is that the authors want to explain the uh, reactions of investors on the stock market to an announcement of an acquisition. What happens when a firm announces that will acquire a target firm? Will investors and market participants react positively? And so uh, the stock returns will, will be higher for that particular firm or not? There's been a lot of research about this but most research has had mostly silver bullet explanation, highlighting the effect of single explanatory factors, maybe the payment me method or the acquisition premium, et cetera. What they try to, the way they, the authors actually motivate the need for more configuration theory is highlighted by this uh, statement in red from their abstract, when they say investors instead are likely to perceive and evaluate them and ace holistically as complex configuration characteristics, which means then that we need to understand how they make just, uh, judgments about these configurations. If we do not consider how the various factors that they evaluate are combined in their mind, then we don't have a full picture on how those positive reactions on the stock market form. How do they go about it? And, and uh, um, they, uh, in, in some ways, uh, uh, um, you know, you can think of configuration theorizing as a process that goes through several steps. The first step, and this is what we highlight in the paper I just mentioned, the deliberate distributed. Um, the, the first step is scoping. By scoping, we mean identifying the relevant attributes that may plausibly interact and form configurations. Um, the second step is linking, which would be thinking about how the various attributes connected interact with each other in more analytical terms. For example, which attributes may be complementary versus which ones instead could substitute each other and be equifinal. And the third one would be naming, which is more labeling the configurations, identify the underlying mechanism and try to evoke those uh, uh, underlying mechanisms with vivid labels and, and names. Uh, as you can tell from this figure, which is the figure we use in the, in the paper I mentioned, uh, uh, is uh, um, full of feedback loops. And the reason is uh, uh, my co-authors and I wanted really to make clear that our experience of engaging with configuration theorizing is a non-linear experience. It's a complex and configurational theorizing process itself in the sense that you may move from one stage to the other. So it's not a linear sequence, but rather there's plenty of back and forth that you do from one uh, step to the other. So don't think of these as a, a step by step mechanicistic, if you want, uh, a recipe for success uh, to do a good configuration paper because that is not necessarily the case. These are hopefully useful steps you can go through, but there could be other ways in which you could do configuration theorizing that we haven't unpicked in, in our particular take. That's why we call it a configuration process and not 
the configuration process. There could be other uh, sorts of processes out there. But let me give an example of what each of these steps you can go through to develop a configuration theory is about. And I will use the paper I mentioned to illustrate the scoping stage, what you do, you try to identify the explanatory uh, uh, attributes that can matter and they can plausibly form configurations. One trick of the trade, if you want, is to, to do what we call complexify from an anchor. So once you have the phenomenon in front of you, complexity is potentially limitless. So you have a feeling of saying, where do I start to theorize? And one way is to start in laying out a set of assumptions or what we call an anchor, which we could be a core concept or a core theory, existing theory in your literature review, what you was referring to as conceptual resource. That's what these uh, authors in the M&A paper I mentioned do very effectively by starting with the idea that investors are boundedly rational. And because of that cannot process all the information is out there, but rather they combine only salient information. And particularly this word salient is particularly important. What are then salient uh, um, signals that investors can, can combine in their evaluations? And, and by using, let's say, these criteria, if you want, to decide the variables that matter, one quantitative study would, they, would say, or in a theory paper would be the concepts that matter, right? What are the concepts that matter in your theory? They start from an anchor, a clear theoretical perspective or a clear concept, and then complexify and reach out, build out from that anchor by thinking about associations uh, uh, between concepts. And what they do there is identifying three sets of elements, which you see here in the, in the boxes, strategic fit, organizational fit, acquire characteristics. And in a way, they cluster them conceptually by simplifying these nine explanatory factors who are all that are all salient consistently with their anchor, going back to you. Uh, point about being consistent, but they can also be clustered conceptually around three buckets, okay? Three core concepts, strategic fit, organizational fit, acquire characteristics. The third bit is also identified plausible coherence, as we say in uh, the MR piece I mentioned in terms of really explain to your audience why it is that these factors can plausibly interact or combine into configurations. Why we as an audience, as uh, readers, do we need to expect these factors to interact to explain that given phenomenon? And so you can say that these three, you can see that these three arrows go join, join together to have an effect. And that joining is really what configuration thinking is about. The second bit, which is about linking. And I note that in the chat, there were a set of questions about, can you have propositions in configuration theorizing? Yes, you can. Uh, have, uh, and indeed, many configuration papers have propositions, but in some cases, there are no propositions. So you can have, but you should not necessarily have. But uh, the propositions, however, will be written in a different way than in a classic propositional theory building paper like the one you was describing. And, and there are two major differences. First of all, uh, there's not necessarily a ceteris paribus logic where you assume, as sometimes it's explicit in the proposition, authors write ceteris paribus. The idea of a configuration proposition is that you actually take all the elements that matter for your configuration and you write them down in the, in the uh, uh, proposi configuration proposition. It is a configuration proposition that typically is longer, highlights more elements and their interactions. And those interactions, and that's what is also different, is not always an if then logic, but mostly is about and and or, or what I call think conjunctively and think equifinally, as we call it in, in that paper. And so what is think conjunctively is think about conjunctions between factors and potential complementarities and contingencies where two elements or two explanatory factors work together to produce an outcome, okay? And we highlight also differences between what it means to be complementary, what it means to be contingent. I, I have to skip that bit given the time, but the proposition and the, the end logic is really crucial 
in configuration propositions. And if you can, you can have potentially a long list of hands, which of, care, of course will require your reviewers to play in their head the full configuration. But you, another important, sorry, apologies. Another important logic is the or. So you could have what are called equifinal configurations. So you could say, suppose you want to explain as they do in their paper, uh, investors reaction to m &A. it should not be necessarily one uh, formula, one sets of uh, uh, explanatory factors that could work for that outcome, it could be multiple. So that's equifinality, multiple routes to the same outcome. And so you can list two or more of those uh, uh, equifinal configurations as part of your proposition and use the conjunction or explicitly in the proposition. That is also unusual to say the least in a classic propositional paper. The typically use a ceteris paribus language, whether explicitly or implicitly, and an if then logic. Um, lastly, the naming part of the process I mentioned, and that process is one process that you, as a theorist, as a theorizer, can go through uh, if, you, if you want to try to build a configuration theory. The last step is called naming. It consists in naming the configurations they are theorized and identify their orchestrating themes. This is another step that the paper I mentioned does very well, where you see here on the, uh, my right-hand column uh, a configuration label. They label the configurations that they identified, in their case empirically, but you can label the configurations they identify uh, theoretically. Think again about typologies that you found particularly influential, right? Uh, uh, where typologies are developed conceptually and you develop names for the types. And those names matter. And so, uh, and that's why in many ways, configuration theorizing, as I said, combines element, elements of analytical thinking with elements of synthetic or semantic thinking. Because the naming part is where you try to simplify complexity and capture the essence of the configurations with crisp names that evoke the essence of the orchestrating themes. What those configurations are really about, how can we make sense of, the, of those configurations and compare and contrast them? So look at these names, for example, geographical scale expansion, geographical scope expansion, aggressive expert related diversification, aggressive rookie related diversifications, of course, these names highlight certain aspects rather than others of the nine factors that the authors uh, examine in their theory, but those are the results of their theorization process where the names highlight particular underlying drivers that you see on the top uh, right of the column that really is the key driver or the key mechanism that helps those elements together, okay? So in this sense, configurational theorizing is in between is analytical, but it's also synthetic and combines process and case-based forms of theorizing with more analytical forms of theorizing. Finally, um, uh, just to conclude and open up again for, for more questions, there are possible challenges and remedies. Uh, the first is that, of course, configurations may be perceived as descriptives and summaries. And so you may want to really foreground the outcome and complicate the picture by really opening your paper in the introduction with a statement about the phenomenon being configurational in its very nature, in your own conceptualization, of course. Configurations may not specify the linkages very well, and so you need to theorize more the mechanisms that underlie those, uh, those elements and how they interact, and really flesh out the mechanism. And finally, uh, configurations may lack parsimony, uh, uh, propositions may be too long, and that's where the naming part comes in. It's so important to illustrate those configurations with exemplary cases, strong instances. They could be vignettes, could be exemplary cases that you came across from your own background or experience, okay? But they really flesh out what each of those configurations are about. I'm gonna stop share here, invite more questions at this point. I think we are up on the time, but as I mentioned previously, we are very happy to stay for more questions. So the floor is really open. Uh, we don't need to go to the concluding slides, which are just two. Um, I think both you and I are very happy to entertain any question you may have. I will you send the slides out as well, please. 
Yes, I think Ibrat will send the slides. Is that correct, Ibrat? Yes, we will. Yeah. Thank you. Bill? Hi, Santi, nice to see you. We met last term. Yes, remember indeed. How are you? QC workshop. I think I, my question will focus on the how question. That is the mechanism linking different elements. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, could you elaborate a little bit on what kind of a mechanism we can explore linking these different elements? Or secondly, when you state the propositional statement, how are you going to put into the mechanism language into the propositional, I mean, configurational propositional statement? Thank you. Yeah, so, so thank you. Excellent, excellent question. So the mechanism for me is really about why why those elements are together. So once you start theorizing the configurations and you have often in your mind strong distances, examples, then you need to sort of interrogate those examples and counter examples, which reviewers are very good at coming up with, why these and not that. And by interrogating your examples, really think about what it is that brings those elements together into a configurations into a configuration that can explain the phenomenon of, of, of interest for you. So I find in brackets, I, I theorize the mechanics by really asking why those elements are often together into a configuration that explain. And that why question may lead you towards discovering the mechanism. The second part of your question, will, I would not put the mechanism in the proposition because that would be too much. The mechanism is usually as part of the argument, which you then have on top, so to speak, if you read the paper from top to bottom, on top of the proposition, what you was saying, you write first the argument, you then write about the mechanism as a justification for which those elements are supposed to be together. And then as part of the proposition, you just mentioned the configuration, not necessarily the mechanism. That would be just too much for the, the proposition. I hope that, that that addresses your point. I think uh, uh, um, Mona is next. Hi. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for this um, insightful presentation. I was wondering if you can give us like um, uh, advices, tactics on how to legitimize actually the approach that we choose to present our theory. So like in our, in our work, we, we, we always start from somewhere. So we have mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, we have like how to strictly legitimize the fact that what's already out there isn't enough to understand the phenomenon that we have at hand and required us to actually build a new theoretical model and also justify that, you know, we used this configuration approach that we believe is better than the propositional or the process approach. So maybe it's two questions, like tactics, advice to strength, make, make, it, make our uh, new proposed theoretical model like more convinced, legitimate in comparison to what exists elsewhere because like we, we start from A, we connect it to some case to have B, our result which has like new theoretical proposal or new theoretical model and you know how to make it to legitimize the, the fact that from where we start there, like the, the theoretical model out there are were not enough actually to understand yeah. this particular phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a very, very, I think most people in the room would really sympathize and understand the struggle we all face, no matter what. And so I, I think part of it has to do with what I uh, tried to say about the motivations. So I think this is about the rhetorical device that we as authors often use in the introduction to really make a case for why more complexity is needed. And it has to do with mixed contradictory findings, for example, in a given set of literature or um, a point of departure. So you could take a point of departure on a phenomenon and say, but 
uh, um, these particular theory, I would not encourage necessarily to take battles with a particular perspective. If anything, a configuration perspective is more integrative and plural than a, a sort of, you know, battle or win a race, a, a, a sort of horse race between theories. It's about considering how multiple theories could potentially explain better a phenomenon of interest. So you could make multiple claims, but, but generally in my experience, the claim that often I've seen, uh, I've seen really worked is the phenomenon is more complex, is more nuanced than each single theory out there can address on its own. And that's why I would need to look at this phenomenon as a configuration. I often say you need to have a configuration research question. Uh, and so, which, which means a configuration perspective or conceptualization of the phenomenon. So in youth language, uh, you start from, a say, from saying, what is this a case of? Uh, it could be a case of multiple things, but your lens is a configuration lens. Okay, it's a case where multiple factors can explain. So, and I found that to work pretty well once you can do it effectively. Then how can you justify it's more complex? You could do it because empirical evidence out there is mixed. You could do it by using an example that really highlights the contrast between the simplicity of previous understanding and the complexity of reality. Or you could do by complexifying the typology that has been well established, uh, what Peter Fis does very well with Miles and Snow. But there are other ways, I'm sure, of how these are just three ways. I'm sure there are many others, so don't take them as the best at all. Mona. Thank you. Yeah. Mayur, would you have to go next? Pardon me? Yes. Hi, Mayur. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sandy and Yup. Uh, uh, great uh, presentation and uh, really uh, learned a great deal. So I have two uh, two uh, brief questions. One is uh, uh, I wanted to know if you have come across some good uh, theoretical articles using configurational theorizing. So I've seen many empirical papers using FSQCA, CSQCA, but rarely seen any theoretical pieces. So if you know some Please uh, do share uh, some of those uh, papers which we can refer to. My second question was, uh, 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 so it was again about, FS, uh, about configurational theorizing is that when we introduce complexity, right, as an answer to something, it is possible that, that the, the original resource was more theorized in a propositional manner. And now you are suggesting that, okay, we, it doesn't make sense or something changes or some assumptions in the original theorizing or the original resources changed. Now you are offering a different set of assumptions and, so, and providing a solution uh, which is more complex and that's why configurational theorizing. So do you think it will create some inconsistencies uh, in the original resource and the solution that you are providing? Do you advise against doing that? or do you have some ways to think uh, about it more systematically? So do, do you want you to take me, take this, or do you want to take the question, if you prefer? I, I can. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you go ahead and then I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll tag on. So uh, these are great questions. And first of all, uh, you're totally right. So there are two ways of thinking about conceptual papers they are configurational. The ones that use explicitly the word configurational and the ones that instead don't use perhaps the word configurational, but they are actually configurational, never earthless in terms of their reasoning. So I will keep in mind that distinction because many theories out there are actually configurational, but they don't use the word configuration, okay? So think about the resource-based view, okay, of the firm. That's configurational. Strategic HR, that's also configurational. Uh, so this means there are more opportunities to flesh that out. And I've been in conversation with others that will work on certain theories, for example, theory of hybrid firms, right? Uh, so um, Basher of, uh, and Smith, for example, the uh, highly cited paper in AMR is configuration in its nature and they know theory of hybridities are configuration, but they don't use the word configuration. Mm -hmm. Recently, an Academy of Annals piece, just to give you an example, 
reconceptualize uh, dynamic capabilities from a configuration lens. What, and this, I think the, all, the other is Walden et al. He's in my slides too, as one picture. If you look back at the early work by Mintzberg and uh, Danny Miller's work, he has many uh, papers in SMJ or AMR, they are explicitly configuration. But what I'm trying to say, because the word configuration is not there, it doesn't mean it's not configuration. This is actually an opportunity for some of you who want to play with this kind of theorizing to just uh, entry, to mix right. what the theoretical logic is with a theory that is inherently or latently configurational, but has not fully yet benefit from this kind of thinking. On the second bit, mixing configuration proposition, yes, I think is a, is a fine line and a tight rope because those, those propositions need to preserve some of that complexity. It can be done, but it requires certain skill because you may end up oversimplifying too much in the proposition. But maybe I don't know you whether you want to take more questions or build on that. Um, no, I I, um, I was just going to add, um, and I'm I'm a big fan also myself of um, configurational thinking, and and particularly because of the causal complexity. So the um, so I mentioned with the propositional style, it's a very simple sense of causality where A is in a way necessary and sufficient for B and. What Santi is getting at is that in many cases we can, uh, and maybe this also connects to the question that was asked earlier, we should think about this in more probabilistic manner. You know, what are, when do the sort of, sort of the conditions align for um, emergent acquisition to be looked at in a particular way? Um, and and this, this, is, this is really, really important and really, really, um, you know, you can really easily make the case for that opening up that more complicating in a constructive manner to be uh, to be important, particularly in the context of literatures that have been based more on this linear variance type of thinking. And, um, and in many, so maybe there are instances when you think about, um, you know, where that linear proposition might actually capture the, the most of the, the causal dynamics at play. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe in an online environment where I'm being, as a you know, one group is being presented with one option, and another group is presented with another option. Then you can reason in 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 that sort of focused, simple manner. But as as in the M and A case that Santi mentioned, or the the uh, you know hybrid hybrid enterprises, there's so much complexity there. Uh, but also the the probabilistic, as opposed to the more deterministic element that that often slips into. Um, propositional thinking that you just overgeneralize or you just, again, assume that A is, is, is a root cause of B, but why, why would it be? You know, maybe there's many other circumstances so it really pushes you to think about the conditions under which the A may be, um, uh, you know, the trigger or, or producing the effect uh, B, but it may, you know, there may be circumstances where that doesn't or not by itself at least. Uh, how does all this relate to grounded theory thinking? So that that's a, a, a kind of a complex question in itself. I think grounded theory uh, number uh, uh, in, is um, very well suited to handle complexity in many ways, right? So it's another style of theorizing that often has to do with process theorizing not necessarily, but often is process theorizing and is another way of handling complexity. Where, however, you focus more on the process and mechanism underlying a phenomenon, often in its temporal unfolding, which is slightly different than uh, the configurational uh, way of theorizing, where you try to identify the combinations of factors that matter while preserving an understanding of the process that generates those configuration. So I think they are connected, although this has not been yet explicit in the conversation. That, uh, uh, that's my particular take, the process and configuration theorizing is a connection between the two. But generally speaking, grounded theory is more oriented towards a process understanding of complexity 
as it unfolds over time. I don't know you if you want to, and, and, and I, then we maybe take buckets of questions because there are many hands raised. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it depends a bit on what you assume with grounder theory. So whether it's the more interpretive or whether it's the more, um, if you take an approach like Goya, it's quite behavioral in a way. So it captures, um, you know, defines a set of constructs or concepts of the, on the back of the, um, the first order data. And as Santi says, typically arranges them in a, in a linear sequence. So in a way you might say antecedent conditions, actions, and some set of outcomes. So a lot of theorizing in the Goya type of tradition um, is, this is my interpretation, is quite linear propositional in nature. So it has that if then structure uh, to it. And it's really about what set of circumstances in what set of circumstances did a particular pattern of action actualize and have this particular outcome? So it doesn't have the type of complexity, I would say, that you also by research design, if you look at multiple cases or multiple instances, you could get at with a configurational approach. So I might take is that, a, but again, if you're doing interpretive ground of theory, then it's a bit different. But I, I think that the more formal behavioral approach that is common in business and management research would, would be, the outcome of that would be a very simple propositional model. Um, you could actually specify propositions, linear propositions around your model on the back of it. Thank you. Shall we maybe take uh, uh, three questions from the hands raised here, if it's fine for everyone. I had initially Sarah uh, first, and then yeah. Wei, Wei Gang and Tatiana. Maybe we'll take these three questions together, and you and I try to respond one each. Yeah. Uh, so, Sarah, you want to go first? If I may, please. So, um, I've been listening to the very interesting session. It came really on the right time because I'm in the process of finalizing my research proposal and defining my model. So I just, now I got a bit lost between the configuration and the grounded theory, uh, because what I did is that since my project has no consensus at all, I'm studying what is uh, the role of employee engagement um, in assuring the growth of small businesses in central territories via, work, uh, via virtual work arrangements. So technically I have my variables. In literature, there is no consensus about uh, employees engagement on the definition of virtual work arrangements. And what is the outcome variable? So within the DACI protocol, I know that the experts would like to measure growth as profits. So this is the outcome variable and the mediator variable would be virtual work arrangements. And uh, the, uh, depend, uh, the independent dependent variable would be um, work uh, employees engagement. So there is this process. I know that there is a causal relationship. It's an explanatory study. I'm gonna interpret, what, interpret, interpret what's happening here. And um, I thought to myself that maybe I would consider a grounded uh, a theory through induction to predict and explain the behavior and to develop a theory from interviews, uh, et cetera. So uh, do you think here, like in literature, there is a lot of theories of defining what is employees engagement. There are a lot of studies de deducing what is the causal relationship, like employee retention, growth, profitability, et cetera. Um, and there is a lot of studies around the dimensions of employees engagement, what are the drivers, how they can be measured, etc. So here, what should I do? Is it grounded theory and follow an, inter um, uh, a, a, an interpretivism as if I'm a, like a detective trying to figure out what it is, it's a new concept, or for example, would you go towards configuration? Okay. Thank you, Sarah. So let's take three questions all together and then we'll, we'll try to address them now. Thank you, Sarah, for the question. I think Wei Gang was uh, next. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sandy. Thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, I have been doing empirical studies, so I'm ignorant of uh, writing theory on conceptual papers. Uh, that said, uh, I don't know if my question is a question. So, uh, my question is this, is there a difference in terms of writing uh, between, you know, uh, a, between writing a empirical paper versus uh, and writing a conceptual paper? Because my assumption is that, uh, well, just be simple and uh, direct. I don't know if this is a 
a question. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. Thanks. Thanks for for sharing this. Absolutely. Yeah. It's definitely a question. A good one, Tatiana. Thank you very much for very insightful uh, presentation. I have a question that probably goes maybe a little bit beyond what you planned for today, because I know in this recently published paper um, by you, you talk about more uh, approaches to theorizing. There are more than three. And I know you said the process theorizing will be a separate webinar. But uh, I'm wondering if you have a space and time to, to share a little bit more of the others beyond the three. Thanks a lot. Do, do, uh, Yup, would you like me to start? You want to start from Sarah, as you prefer? You're boss. You you decide. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll try to be very brief, Sarah. I, I'll start with Sarah, and maybe uh, you you take on on the. But I think that I think the question, what should I do, is more about what it is that you want to do. Uh, uh, and I often get the question, what should I do? And I think there is no correct answer because the, the answer is more in your hands in terms of, uh, uh, you know the literature better and what it is that is missing there. Is it missing a more process understanding of employee engagement in terms of how it unfolds over time? Or is it, is it a more configuration understanding, which means how the various explanatory factors that have been highlighted by uh, multiple theories can actually combine together into multiple configurations, or perhaps it's a more kind of uh, simplicity that we mix uh, and some more uh, parsimonious explanation of aspects of the phenomenon. So I just want to uh, say uh, that I think generally we may think there is one right way, but it all depends on the state of the art uh, uh, of the conversation, the literature on that particular phenomenon, and as you were saying, on the conceptualization that you want to embrace. So I think you have more agency <laughs> than you, uh, that, 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 that we may think. And so it's in your hands uh, to, to think what it is that the, 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 the conversation employee engagement uh, needs. I hope that addresses it, but I'm happy to, if you want to email me, we can talk further about this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I? Um... I, I know we have limited time, but I'm just going to uh, also add, add to uh, to your case, Sarah. Um, so I think exactly what Santi said, you, uh, you you obviously have liberty and freedom here to go for a particular angle. And it, it seems from what you described that you're interested also in employee engagement and HRM related issues that are uh, driving the growth of, of small firms or, or lead them to a level of, of an initial growth uh, that they need to uh, that they need to get to. Um, thinking about this configurational thinking, um, so this could be an HR perspective, and I'm sure there's lots of HR research on uh, small growth, uh, on small firm growth and development. But you could also pitch it the other way around. So if you look at the outcome of you know um, early stage growth of a small firm, and then reason backwards, so this would be at, at least in my mind more of a configurational approach, you could think about all of the, in Santi's words, attributes that might have some bearing in combination on that particular outcome to be realized. So that could be HR issues, could be finance issues, that could be identity or routine issues, that could be, um, and, and even at the level of HR, there could be employee engagement, but it could also be certain aspects of uh, selection and retention or socialization that, that matter. And that, that I'm sure have been in isolation, been looked at, but when you reason back from the outcome that you want to explain, which is an important outcome. So how come that some firms, small firms get to that level and may be able to sustain the venture and which ones don't? Uh, there's, there's a real opportunity there, it seems for, as there will be for many other topics, but also in this topic for, for more complex configurational thinking. And that allows you, uh, going back to Santi's slides, to really operate between different literatures that probably exist on this and bring them together and then get a research design that allows you to play them out against each other and have this more configurational complex perspective on, on what are the possible recipes of combinations of attributes that lead in this bounded empirical setting that lead to, uh, to, to, to small firm growth. That would be really interesting, I think. 
Thank you so much. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So why 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 Gang? Your your question. What you know? What is 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 the the approach or the practices of how you write a theory paper different from an empirical paper? I would say yes. Uh, so there's many commonalities. So there's many um, theoretical things that you have to do for both. So you have to be, uh, you know, some of the things we talked about, but, you know, you have to frame and motivate um, the, the study that you're doing, whether that's a theoretical study or an empirical study. You have to have clarity about clearly define the core concepts or constructs that you work with. So you have to do a lot of things similarly in both. Um, but I think a key difference is that it, with an empirical paper, you're obviously uh, the data afford certain things, but they also constrain you in certain ways. And, and Santi mentioned at the beginning um, that the nice thing with a theory paper is that it's a bit like a broad canvas. So you can approach a phenomenon in a much broader way and you're not necessarily constrained by the data that you have or that the data that you can potentially uh, gather on a particular topic. So that, that's a real key advantage. It's also a downside because having that broad canvas means that you can, you know, um, you can easily make things too complex or make it too grand as opposed to, and that's a typical challenge for theory papers to realize that the, to keep it small and focused and to unfold those ideas with enough detail and nuance is already enough for a contribution. So don't overdo it by making it too big. Um, that would be my take, but, but there's many, many commonalities. If you're a good uh, theorist, then I'm sure, you know, you could also be, a, a, you, you, you will, you know, use those same skills as you're doing empirical research. So there's a lot of commonality between them. Thank you. Thank you. I have, I have one other question if no one else wants to go. I think it was Tatiana's question too. Okay. If, if you and and Sorry. just a second, Pim, we I think we may well have the time for one one more. But uh, yeah. do you also want to? Uh, uh, yeah. So I um in, in as Tatiana mentioned in the editorial, we talk about other styles of theorizing, and um, and today we we talked pretty much about the explanatory tradition, uh, and in the editorial we talk about typical styles that are in that explanatory tradition as far as theory papers are concerned. Um, it's good to bear in mind that the explanatory tradition is probably uh, the default tradition in, in our ways of thinking about theory, in our ways of thinking, uh, also empirically, when people do empirical research, uh, it's, it's, it's the default uh, way of thinking about this. Um, but it's, it's, it's important to recognize that it's not necessarily better than other theorizing traditions. So when you uh, think of an interpretive tradition that, you know, we mentioned grounder theory, that could be, um, that could equally be possible to have a really strongly rooted interpretive grounder theory perspective on a particular topic as an empirical piece. Uh, but equally, and then I'm talking about theory papers, you could think of critical essays that provoke us into thinking about topics in new ways or help us become more reflexive about the, uh, the assumptions and the biases that we might have been operating from up until this point in time. Um, and these are really valuable contributions to break open, to generate new ideas, but also to break open the conversation and, and, um, and not just have that greater reflexivity, but they also open up and they lead into new conversations and new directions for research. Um, so with organization theory, the journal, we also try to actively encourage people to write in, in uh, we use this word here in this session of different idioms or different styles. So using different ways of arguing and articulating and theorizing about phenomena, which is, and, and in forms that don't always lead to a model or propositions or a set of explanations, but it could lead to something else. They could just be, ending. Uh, so we have a wonderful piece just now coming out, which is a critique of a lot of the sustainability ideas that are circulating in the social sciences, including in business and management research. So it just critiques these concepts and has us think about how could we think about the relationship between us as individuals, but equally organizations and the environment, the natural environment in different ways. Um, and it doesn't give us a model, doesn't give us 
maybe it gives a few conceptual pointers, but but you know it just pushes us to to reflect and to uh, to rethink and reframe uh, this. And and I'm sure there will be in the aftermath of that paper people who will take this on and, and take it forward. But the paper itself is just a provocation. We have uh, three more hands raised. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, Ahmad, maybe we can do the same system. Ahmad, Pim, uh, Nidi, if you can just uh, uh, briefly, concisely say your questions and we, we take them on together, if, if it's okay. Okay, oh, thanks. Sorry, thanks. sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, thank you very much for the presentation. So my question is actually like, what, how are you going to theorize when you are in a situation the findings are contradicting each other, right? So you have certain informants, I mean, certain cases within your research where they say that we can do A. But you have also other uh, participants who say that we cannot do A. So it, they are contradicting each other. So in this kind of situation, what would be the best uh, theorization? Configuration maybe? Thank you. Thank you, Amant. Hi. Yeah, so uh, could you just in, in, in a couple of sentences uh, you know, distinguish the difference between configurational and process? Because in my mind, a process is a configuration and a configuration is a process. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bim. Nidhi? Uh, good evening, Professor. Thank you so much for the insightful session. Well, uh, my question is to is that that uh, if uh, like already existing, we have to extend the existing theory, or we can develop some new theory as well. And if we are developing some new kind of a theory, say I am uh, I was I am uh, you know doing my research in marketing area. So I was thinking that I should do some uh, kind of a theory, develop kind of a theory in uh, viral uh, context. Like nowadays, we are uh, seeing there are two platforms, offline uh, platforms and uh, uh, online platforms. So there are very less theories which are related to the online platforms uh, when I did the literature. So, but I don't know, like I'm a new research scholar, so I don't know exactly after going through the literature how to present that theory, how to develop that theory, and in what context, who will be authenticate that reliability of that theory, that in which direction I'm moving, whether it is authenticate, it is reliable, or what I mean, uh, like, I, you know, you must be understanding my point of view what I'm exactly asking. So I'm looking forward to further sessions that if you people, uh, professors like help me in uh, developing such kind of a theories and not only like if we put forward something that to have reliability, authenticity, and we know the exact method of testing. Like it is not a quantitative study. We can test this is correct. So it is a qualitative kind of a study. So how we present our work to the other people yes it is a reliable or you can share some kind of a paper in which such kind of a thing is already done maybe i don't know my question is not that much appropriate but yes i don't know this exactly i yeah thank you Nidhi. no i absolutely it's very appropriate thank you for for sharing thank you thank you you would you like to start or you want me to start? You go ahead because I think the process configurational that's really yeah. important. Yeah. So, so in terms of Pim's question, uh, uh, the process and configuration, I think Pim, you you have a point that the two are related, and actually this is an opportunity because uh, it hasn't been figured out much the way they are related. So I think you do have a point, but I do see distinctions too. The, the first distinction is, at least to me, process is uh, the unit of observation. Often the unit of theorization are often events. And the events is a key building block. And time is a key consideration. You could have configurational theorizing of, let's say, configurational evolution or configurational emergence. There have been examples, Nikolai Siegelkopf work or uh, Hallenmeyer. 
uh, work that is more temporal, but let's say the time hasn't been at the center stage of theorizing in configurations. I'm not saying it cannot be, but generally speaking with process, you have more of a focus on events and on time. Uh, will uh, configuration theorizing imply a certain process? I do think so that if you have a configuration, there is a process that, but for that matter, I think process and various theorizing are, are connected too. Because if you have variance, you should have some sense of process. So process is key. So, but, but these are um, uh, in a way analytically distinguishable, but also you can try to connect the two. And indeed we are planning to do an event as well where we explore the connections. So if, that, if that's the case, watch out and the next day on because we plan to do more about how to combine configuration and process theorizing. Thank you. Yup, you want to take some of the others? Yeah, so I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, um, I forgot your name now. The, um, I think it's Needy, the, um, you, mm -hmm. you asked the question in terms of, um, I think a very broad question. And again, it's maybe difficult to, uh, to offer very specific suggestions beyond you know a particular context so beyond the uh, the paper that you're working on or the the study that you're doing um i think it's maybe to an extent as i was listening to what you were asking um it's maybe going back to what santi the point santi made earlier you know how you motivate and make the case for your theoretical perspective or the the, the resource that you bring in and, and realizing that you have creativity there to do that, but that ultimately, as always, you really need to um, engage in, an, in a process of reasoning your case for that new perspective. Um, and that is in relation to the existing literature. So how is this different? How does it extend? How, how, how um, do I really advance current thinking on this? Um, and then when you bring in the new resource that you really, uh, it's not just suggesting it or declaring something or stating something, but you really go through the, the, uh, the process of, of detailing your argumentation in the manuscript. Um, and, then, and then you get to questions around the level of detail of your argumentation as to whether that sound, uh, yeah, as you said, I mean, you said authentic, I think, and reliable or valid or plausible if it's a theory piece. Um, you know, those are things that, uh, based on the logic and the, the depth of your reasoning, you will be able to address and, and get across, and then hopefully reviewers or readers will judge it as such. Um, but as always, this, um, you know, that's where we also need other people, um, supervisors, colleagues, but also reviewers of journals to help us uh, test this for us and to see whether uh, potential members of our audience actually believe that our argumentation is at that right level and that we've really made the case through our reasoning for a new perspective. I think there's been a bit of a sound or mic issue, but you are you are you okay with the sound? Yeah. 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 So I I was I just going to say I do need to leave in a minute to uh, to cook for my kids, but uh, we both have sort of kids yeah. to be coming up, <laughs> which is a very practical if you want to contrast theory and practice, a very practical kind of uh, uh, call. So I I can uh, actually with pleasure also uh, um, engage with Ahmed uh, question about contradictions. Yeah. I think that's an opportunity. Certainly, if there is a contradiction then is a call to understand and theorize why there is that contradiction. You may also check some of the recent papers in AMR about abduction and how abduction is related in theorizing surprises or contradictions. You can mm. certainly theorize contradictions to a weak, a weak configuration theorizing, but since you, you mentioned interviews, it also seems a, an empirical paper. And so it depends on yeah. the nature of your data, of your sample, and the kind of conceptualization you have of the phenomenon. Are you conceptualizing and foregrounding more the process view or the configurational view? So we can also take it offline if you want to drop me a line, but generally depends fundamentally on how you theorize the, the phenomenon, how you conceptualize your phenomenon of interest. And both with process and configuration, you can definitely 
address uh, or proposition for that matter uh, the, the the contradictions. Yeah. Okay. So I see that as yeah. an opportunity for theorizing. Yeah, I think that's uh, fair enough. Thank you.